Alright, hey everybody. Uh, Alright, so today uh, I want to start with a few short clips uh, from the Chronicles of Shannara, which I talked about in episode one. Uh, that's right. So, you know, we're on episode three and I'm already doing callbacks. Uh, so this could get ugly. But the other is from Once Upon a Time. So let's check. Magic is not a weapon. It is a gift. But it always comes with a price. All magic comes with a price. Magic always comes with a price. And now it's yours to pay. I know all magic comes with a price. Saving it must come with a price too. All magic comes with a price. So as I've established in the last two episodes, we're going to talk about those scenes, uh, but probably not yet. Uh, because like always, and three episodes being always, uh, I want to foreground and contextualize some of the ideas that may not yet entirely have to do with the clip, uh, but are certainly part of the discussion. So first off, um, Once Upon a Time is currently uh, on its last season of Seven, and for those unfamiliar with the show, it, it's premised on all the characters of the different fairy tales, fairy tale worlds ultimately ending up on Earth, uh, and how they interact with the real world. There's more to it than that, but you can look that up on Wikipedia. Uh, and that brings me to today's public service announcement, which is, do you use Wikipedia? Do you find yourself double checking one fact or another? Uh, if you use it half as much as you probably pretend that you don't, uh, then you should consider donating to it or contributing to it. Really, Wikipedia is an amazing project of the 21st century uh, to pool together our collective knowledge. So if you use it, do your fair share of supporting it. Back to Once Upon a Time. So the premise, as a premise the, of, the, of the folks of, of fairy tales finding their way inexplicably to our world, this is not entirely a new idea. Uh, in the last 30 years, the series has several predecessors that have gotten reasonable and widespread attention uh, and I think has some interesting implications. So let's talk about a few of those predecessors. Uh, there was The Charmings in 1987, and this was a two-season show that did not make much of an impact, um, but had Snow White and Prince Charming awaken to the 20th century uh, to make sense of what life was like in the 1980s. Those poor, poor fools. Um, one of the earliest, one, one a little bit later, uh, and one of my personal favorites is The Tenth Kingdom, which aired on NBC in 2000. Uh, the story focused on a plot by the evil queen uh, that eventually led the characters of the nine fairy tale fairy tale kingdoms to end up in the tenth kingdom, which was Earth. Uh, and sure enough, the characters go back and forth as the, as the plot needs. Another example is Enchanted, which came out in two thousand seven. Uh, I'm not as versed in that film, but it. it it is that premise of the fairy tale folks you know, coming to the real world, uh, but I can't really talk about it too much. However, I can talk about Bill Willingham's award-winning comic book series, Fables. Now, if you like fantasy and literature and fairy tales or the works of Neil Gaiman, Jasper Ford, or Gregory Maguire, then you need to read Fables. Uh, seriously, it's 24 or so volumes of amazing and powerful storytelling. And the premise of Fables is that the, that the fairy tale homelands have been invaded by the adversary, and thus they have had to flee to this world uh, where they set up life in downtown New York for the human fables uh, in a farm in upstate New York for the non-human fables. The series is about them existing in the real world uh, and eventually trying to find a way back to their homes and what that might cost them. So if you're if you're a fan of Once Upon a Time, that sounds strikingly familiar, uh, and you feel, and you may feel like Fables is ripping off Once, uh, but just keep in mind that Fables started out in 2002 uh, as a comic book series and was alive and well for over eight years before Once Upon a Time uh, in telling amazing stories since the series has concluded. But um, it. it just be sure to check it out. Um, in fact, check your local library. That's 
just get it. Uh, so now I'm fascinated by this idea of the fairy tale, uh, the fairy tale world coming to the real world. And I'd be curious if you have some other examples where particularly fairy tale characters turn out to be real uh, and end up on Earth. I'm not as interested in fantastical characters turn out uh, fantastical characters coming to our world. That's a pretty common theme in fantasy and science fiction and horror. Uh, and I'm not interested in humans who travel to fantasy worlds such as Alice in Wonderland or Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, uh, The Wizard of Oz or The Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, those are equally interesting, but as the examples I point out, they go back hundreds of years. Uh, but when the fairy tale characters turn out to be real and come over to Earth, I feel like that's a fairly new exploration within the genre. Uh, something of the, the last 20 or 30 years, and it's made me thinking about why or how we might explore that. Now, here's what I love about pop culture is I'm going to offer up several different ways of making sense of this. And they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, they can all be accurate. Uh, they can all be accurate means of interpreting these texts. Uh, by the way, texts uh, is the name that we give something we're studying in cultural studies, often regardless of whether it is actually textual, visual, or oral in form. So interpreting these texts is a matter of where we place emphasis, how we contextualize them, and how we are deconstructing scenes and characters, themes and motifs uh, of the particular text. So what are some of the ways we could read this, this concept of established fairy tale characters being real and from a different world and traveling to Earth? In the world of in the world of Disney, the 20th century manufacturers of magic and entertainment, this concept can tell us that in a very real way, uh, fantasy is emerging with the real world, right? Consider the theme park Disney. Uh, it, it's the mecca of all theme parks. Operates, it operates to make it seem like everything is a perfect and magical experience including jeopardizing the health of their employees. Uh, a great book to read, is, and there are many subjects on this, um, is Inside the Mouse by the Disney Project. And here we'll, we find Disney subjects workers and people to questionable and concerning situations, um, all in the hopes of preserving the magic. Uh, so when we think about Disney and its emphasis on, you know, to wish upon a star and where dreams come true, uh, this concept, especially given that Once Upon a Time is a product of Disney, is showing us how much fantasy is merging with the real world. Thus the concept maybe capture this concept of the fairy tales coming to the real world maybe capturing the idea of fairy tales invading our lives to the point that it's hard to tell if people and characters it, 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 to tell if people are characters or real people which leads me to my second thought uh, given this time period of the last 20 years we've we've all, also found that reality is becoming more fictionalized uh, with the rise of reality TV, wherein supposed real people are crafted into a fictional story. And it's often wrapped up in a fairy tale, such as a partner of one's dreams or winning a fortune or acquiring a job of one's dreams. Uh, the happy ever afters that so many of us are reaching for. The abundance of reality TV and its impact has certainly contributed to the rise of a reality TV uh, star becoming president, and its impact has certainly contributed to the rise. Uh, sorry, um, in challenge, challenging our conceptions of fact and fiction. Thus, the the concept of fairy tales coming to Earth. Uh, could just be a way of having that discussion of how far from reality have we traveled. Another way of looking at this concept 
uh, is the rise of false news, misinformation, and fake news in how it's grown over the last 20 years. And thus, exploring the world becomes kind of a choose-your-own-adventure. Uh, we get to engage in the fairy tales that we find most rewarding. Uh, fairy tales are often tales about morality and justice and appropriate endings. Uh, then selecting news that confirms your own biases uh, is an easy extension of, of reinforcing what you think is right in the world. Even if it is a fantasy of sorts, you don't you don't have to listen to things that you that don't fit your own fairy tales. You can find your own type of news. Uh, you can silence friends by defriending them. And you can label news that you don't like as fake news. Uh, one extension of this point is to also think about how we are and have been a very nostalgic culture, regularly pretending the past was this pastoral and, and wondrous place. Uh, thus, we have people claiming that they will make America great again, uh, or that millennials are not as good as previous generations, or the usual chestnut of how youth are just so much more horrible than the past, or that there's more crime today than in the past. Uh, in fact, check, there's less crime um, and for more on that, you can check out Steven Pinker's The Better Nature of Our Angels, uh, which is a massive book. It's, uh, let's see, almost 800 pages uh, and worth reading every single page and all of the research that he cites. So we are constantly, we, we constantly pretend that the past was a better place, uh, even though in many ways the past was more violent and less humane. Uh, but that doesn't prevent us, from, prevent us from yearning for the fairy tales of yesterday to the point that they become real figments of our imagination. It's partly why we, we have remakes or retellings of, of stories or why we engage in story franchises such as Star Trek, and Star Wars, or Harry Potter. Potter. Um, it is also fascinating because if you go back and read the original fairy tales, the ones the Grimm brothers and, and others actually wrote versus how we have rewritten them since, you will find they are not as, as feel good as we like to think they are. Um, so another way of, of understanding this, of course, is, as I've mentioned, uh, is that we are just more enthralled in stories as we have ever been. Uh, and therefore wish to make them as real as possible. Uh, of course, this extends beyond the concept that I'm talking about uh, and extends to nearly all fiction. But fantasy, you know, fairy tales is an extension of that, um, have been gaining more steam, if you will. See what I did there? <laughs> I made a pun because steam is a reference to a steam engine and that's a reference to the industrial age, which is largely the opposite of what we talk about when we talk about fantasy. That is the age of machines. Um, now I know, I know puns lose their magic, right? See what I did there? Um, if you have to explain them, but anyways, I did. So fantasy has become a huge storytelling genre in the last 30 years, uh, but not just within books, but also in movies and TV series, right? If you look at the, the 1970s and the 1980s, fantasy was, a, was largely a genre for children and youth, if, you know, such as Neverending Story, Labyrinth, Dark Crystal, uh, or low-budget or dubious genre films, Conan the Barbarian, Beastmaster, Clash, and Clash of the Titans, all of those, uh, all of those later, later ones have, of course, since been remade, um, to no one's surprise. But even the original Hobbit and Lord of the Rings were actually cartoons, which tells you the, the audience it was geared towards, right? FYI, prior to The Simpsons, cartoons were largely designated as children's fare. But today, fantasy is huge. Uh, in terms of film between The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, live action versions of Cinderella, Maleficent, Harry Potter, and many, many others. Uh, fantasy is also huge on TV now, too, with Game of Thrones, The Chronicles of Shar uh, Shannara, uh, and The Magicians, and many other series. And the cornerstone of fantasy is this idea of magic. 
Uh, magic comes in numerous forms in fantasy. It's not just a power, uh, but it is also often imbued into, into creatures as well, such as dragons and fairies and other beings, uh, that they can do things beyond what we consider life in the natural world capable of doing. Magic is such a curious thing in fantasy, as it is never straightforward and almost always comes with different rules or challenges uh, to acquiring it. Uh, it, can, it can be all-consuming or be capable of mere parlor tricks. Uh, in most fantasy worlds, though, it allows humans to do more than is possible, uh, more than what is possible within the physical limits of their world. And often fantasy worlds uh, are set on... Fantasy is often set on worlds that mirror medieval times or are clearly pre-industrial societies, right? So thus magic comes in forms that allow people to fundamentally change what they look like, travel great distances shortly, execute destruction on massive scale, and make people do things they don't want to, uh, among many other abilities. So... This brings me to Arthur C. Clarke, uh, author of 2001 A Space Odyssey, and one of the fathers of science fiction. Uh, has a set, he has a set of laws, all of which are interesting, but for this discussion, it's his third law that's most intriguing. It states that any sufficient, tech, advan any sufficient advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. The inverse of that is that magic can be often understood as any sufficient advanced technology. So when we look at today's fantasy with all the magic that it wields, it raises some fascinating questions about fantasy's commentary on technology in our society. After all, many of us are walking, are walking through the world exposed to technologies that most of us cannot explain. In, it can create what can be best described as magic. Uh, consider Star Wars Rogue One, wherein the technology of CGI recreated Grand Moff Tarkin, uh, originally played by Peter Cushion, a man that had been dead for over two decades. Those that did not know they were watching a CGI replica largely did not notice. Uh, those that... Uh, excuse me. Uh, you inevitably are watching this on YouTube, possibly with a device um, that is not connected to an energy outlet or an internet outlet, or a device that has that capacity. And you're still able to watch this video. Uh, in fact, a thousand of you could be watching this at the same time in a thousand different locations. The technology of today continues to border on the magical. And that has been increasingly true over the last 30 years. When we went from computers that were big and clunky and immovable uh, to computers that are watches. And the, the, the capability to voice activate, uh, the capability to voice activate devices and homes. We speak in machines listen, just like magicians who, uses, who use spells, right? And so finally, right, finally, we come back to the quote that we started with. Magic always comes with a price. In both fantasy series, uh, this seems to be a warning to the characters, but just as much a warning to the audience. Technology always comes with a price. Doesn't it though? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not a technophobe. That should be obvious just by the fact that I'm using innumerable technology. I'm using innumerable magic spells. I'm sorry, technologies uh, to make this video available to viewers around the world. Uh, but there are trade-offs to the technology. Make no mistake. When we choose certain technologies, we open some doors and close others, and in many ways, that can have consequences. In fact, the, that is the one price of technology. It does change how we do things, how we move through the world, who we interact with, and how we interact. So much of fantasy in the modern world tells us that. Now, what's interesting with fantasy is that the kind of lessons it tells us. So here are some questions to explore the next time you're watching some fantasy that includes magic. When you watch fantasy, ask yourself, does the story tell us not to use magic at all? 
Does it tell us to be careful or mindful with our magic? Does it tell us to limit the price of the magic to the user, right? So if magic always comes with a price, who pays that price? Does it seek to destroy magic or those who use it? Do the beings who can use magic look to control others or do they run the world? Can anyone learn magic or only special, or only special people? Is it inheritable or random? Do the magic users serve the elite or do they operate outside of the ruling class? Or are they scattered throughout all parts of society? So go out and explore and let me know what you discover. Um, so, what is, so, so that kind of wraps things up for today. What are your thoughts on today's episode? Uh, I'd love to hear them, so post them in the comments below or hit me up on Twitter, at uh, L-E-A-T-O-N-0-1. And before ending today's episode, I've got some shout outs uh, to give for people, for, for today's video, uh, for those that helped me find a few more examples of fairy tales coming to the real world. So thank you, Jen, Carolyn, Dave, Kate, Chris, Kathy, Kelsey, Shoshana, Jesse, Trisha, Rob, Bill, Sarah Ray, Carrie, Lindsay, Andy, you're all the bestest. Yes, clearly I had a lot of help in this. Um, so see you all next week. Keep watching and keep thinking.